when you talk about webhooks, there's not, yeah, I got it and thank you. MQTT is a little bit different in that because that event has no, and there's different levels. There's the what they call quality of service is zero, yeah. one, and two. And But 90% of all MQTT traffic goes over and it basically says, hey, here's a message. Oh, I don't know if you got it. I don't know if you received it and I don't care. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, Elevage IQ. When you think of Industry 4.0 technologies, maybe you think of them as increasing operational efficiencies or reducing waste. But do you know that Industry 4.0 technologies can drive customer experience and sales? And we are not talking about the companies that might be selling Industry 4.0 components or to system integrators or OEMs. These are upsell and cross-sell opportunities by simply gathering data from devices and overlaying that with your CRM data. In today's episode, our guest, Rob Rastovich, shares his insights into how Industry 4.0 technologies can drive customer experience. He also provides his insights into the Industry 4.0 company that he ended up selling to Amazon. Finally, we discussed the differences between machine-to-machine IoT, PubSub model, and where MQTT would be a fit in the architecture, and finally, what is required to replicate Industry 4.0 workloads on cloud farms. Let me introduce Rob to you. Rob Rastovich has been actively involved in technology for nearly 30 years, from building a top 10 e-commerce site in a time when e-commerce was still in its infancy, to establishing what is known as Amazon's AWS IoT. With Rob as a CTO, Thing Logics was awarded the 2018 IoT Platforms Leadership Award and has become an advanced tier technology partner for Amazon Web Services. When he is not at the forefront of IoT, Rob can be found maintaining his century old cattle ranch, barley beef, in central Oregon. With that, Let's get to the conversation. Hey, Rob. Welcome to the show. Hey, hey, Sam. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you having us on. Yeah, and I am super pumped to have you as well because the kind of stories that you are going to have from the Industry 4.0 community, it's always very fascinating, the amount of development that is happening in that space. Um, Just to kick things off, do you want to start with your personal story and your current focus, Rob? Sure. Yeah. So I have, <clears throat> so I, I kind of run a dual life. I'm a, uh, I'm the CTO of Thing Logics. Yeah. Uh, Thing Logics was actually born out of a startup company that we had in Denver uh, in the early 2000s um, that was ultimately sold to Amazon and became today what is uh, Amazon, the IoT microservice. Mm. And Thing Logic was born around um, providing professional services and context of how to implement that service in the world of IoT. Very cool. Uh, I also happen to be a cat. I happen to be a cattle rancher in Central Oregon, so a lot of our use cases, uh, not surprisingly, so around IoT center around agriculture and yeah. those kinds of things. Because I have my own little own little uh, laboratory here that I get to experiment with. So, yeah, um, that's kind of the long and short of it. Okay, very interesting. So I think the marriage of both worlds, the best in technology and best in agriculture. I think that's where the marriage happens. So it's going to be so much fun uh, discussing all of that. Um, so before we get into the real stories, we have one of these standard questions that we ask every single guest that come on the show, and that is going to be, Rob, your perspective on business growth. So my perspective is that we have a, a change in the economy. We have a changing of business models. You know, some people have called it the subscription economy, 
where we are start starting to move away from you know kind of um i request products and i'm giving products or i request service and i get services uh, we really focus on more the um, subscription model. So let me give you an example that I think illustrates where I think businesses are headed, yeah. uh, and what um, you know, and what the enterprises are 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 really trending toward. I had a uh, a guy come to me when we were back in the early days, and he wanted to, he wanted to upgrade his website. He was a pool service. Yeah, um, he did you know clean pools and jacuzzis and those kinds of yeah. things. And he really wanted to take his business to the next level. And so he came and he says, I got an idea. I want you to help me out. I want you to be able to, you know, I want to be able to schedule my pool cleanings on, 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 online. Yeah. I want to be, I want my customers to be able to order products online. Yeah. I want them to be able to schedule maintenance and that kind of stuff online. Yeah. And he really wanted to upgrade his business, you know, and say, all right, I want to take it to the next level. Well, yeah. I says, Let's think about this a little bit differently because that's still the old model, right? Yeah. I call it the request response model. Yeah. I request and I get a response. And that's kind of what technology does too today, right? You know, yeah. you send a request, you get a response. Um, but instead of doing that, I says, let's take in, in, and start you uh, with a connected pool pump, right? Yeah. So this connected pool pump now goes into the pool and it sends data back in real time to him. So it sends him back the chemical levels. It sends him back diagnostics. And so now his model becomes very, very different. His, instead of, you know, people coming to request chemicals, chemicals arrive when they're needed. Instead yeah. of people requesting ma maintenance on it, we schedule the maintenance, you know, two weeks before the pump is going to break, as opposed to the Friday night before the pool party on Saturday, right? Yeah. And that that is a very different model, that subscription-based uh, and we're seeing it, you know, in all kinds of uh, other industries. Uh, you got Spotify, we got Netflix, you know, subscrip subscription based services are, you know, are definitely pushing the edge. Um, but I think we're going to move more of our company to that. And I think what's happening in the C-suite these days is they're yeah. trying to figure out how do I do that? How do I turn my business into a more subscription based business? And that type of business is stickier, right? It's a relationship with the customer. It's not just a transactional relationship where we do, you know, I sell you something and then you go away. You know, you're we're tied together and it becomes a very different way of doing this. And I think, you know, we're seeing that evolve not just in the IoT world, but in every facet. Yeah, could not agree more. And uh, subscription economy and the business model is definitely uh, sort of in its uh, infancy, there are some industries that are doing really well there. I don't know whether you followed the recent um, sort of the acquisition of Zora and or the merger. I don't know whether that is acquisition or, or merger, but one of those. Um, but Zora and uh, Zephyr, and I don't know if you are familiar with those brands. Zora is known for subscription billing. They are one of the mm -hmm. top yeah. best of breed. Mm -hmm. uh, in, they were probably in Cloud 100 and then... Uh, Zephyr is more of the experience platform around the subscription. They do really, really well in media and telco. Um, so they are sort of coming together in, in combining that. So obviously, there's a lot that can happen in the subscription space. There are. It's going to be interesting to see how other industries are going to actually evolve overall from the subscription perspective, as well as when you layer in the IoT, and then you are going to have yeah. subscription, obviously, that's going to be. So now let's go back to your background. And I don't know your involvement with things, logics, and uh, you mentioned that Amazon ended up acquiring that. So I don't know if you're going to have some more layers there in terms of why they acquired this company, then building their own capability. Obviously, when you think of Amazon, they are one of the top in technology. So do you want to provide some some backstory there overall? Sure. Why uh, Amazon ended up acquiring? Yeah, sure. So um, we actually, we started the company um, to, to, to 2012-ish, okay. uh, 2011. Uh, and the idea was a bunch of us, we were, we were doing cloud um, computing, a lot of Salesforce consulting. And we realized yeah. back then it was called machine to machine, right? It wasn't yeah. called IoT. So um, the ability for one machine to talk to the other, you know, we were starting to see the emergence of things like the Nest thermometer, right? You know, the smart home was kind of the first one starts to come on where you actually see messages and, you know, smart devices talking to each other. So Great. we we looked at that and we said, you know what, there is going to be, you know, this is, you know, being, when, when we start kind of unleashing your mind you start realizing that everything is connected and right. how machines could talk to each other i mean we've been doing it for servers for either 
But now we said, okay, well, let's not just do it with servers talking to each other. Let's actually do things, you know, devices, thermostats, temperatures, yeah. irrigation pumps, those kinds of things. And we thought that that was going to be it. And so I'm at, coming from the Salesforce ecosystem, our goal was yeah. actually to develop a technology that could ingest billions and billions of bits of data simultaneously, because that's what you're going to need yeah. in this new world of streaming data. And our goal was actually to sell it to Salesforce. We had a customer that came along and he said, um, you know what, we need you to prove out the scope. Back okay. then, being able to do, uh, you know, 10 million simultaneous connections, and that's 10 million simultaneous connections every millisecond, right? Yeah. Um, that was that was something that, you know, people were like, well, can you really do that? <laughs> Is that yeah. really possible? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of prove it, show it to me. Right. So the only way to actually prove it and show it to you know our customer and saying, hey, yeah, we can do this, was to spin up an infrastructure okay. that was big enough so that A, it could handle 10 million simultaneous connections, right. but also B, you had to have enough infrastructure there to send 10 million simultaneous connections. Right. So right. The, the story, uh, the, the company was called Telemetry and it was in, in Denver. Yeah. And the... Uh, the it's a it's a great acquisition story. We spun it up and we quite literally got a call from Amazon and said, yeah. please stop that. <laughs> what are you doing? Because we had spun up thousands and thousands of these EC2 instances and the infrastructure, you know, set off some alarms. And so they wanted to know what we were doing. So we told them. Yeah. And they were and the, they were in the process of trying to figure out that same type of architecture. And we happened to be probably a year ahead of where they were at. And so huh. they said, OK. Well, let's we'll just take and uh, acquire that technology. So they acquired the technology, um, most of the the personnel too. I didn't go to Amazon because there was no place in Seattle to put 300 cows. I stayed, and we we spun up Thing Logics to do professional services around the technology that Amazon. Since at that time there was really nobody doing IoT kind of applications. Okay, so very interesting layers there. So obviously, I want a little bit more backstory. I think, like to think more like a business guy, and uh, my audience is going to be CFOs and CEOs. So obviously, 10 million connections is fascinating. But describe the business problem and the business model a little bit. Why is Salesforce ecosystem coming and making 10 million connections? What is going on here? Because Salesforce, when my executives are going to think in their head they are thinking crm they are thinking customer mm -hmm. experience so you know are we talking about a business that is making as many connections or are we talking about some sort of devices machines uh, is it more of the customer driven data that is making 10 million so why are we making 10 million connections to begin with yeah so great question so what what's the business case in this so let's let's take it from the crm perspective right, right. so the idea when uh, mark benioff and parker harris I mean, when they sat down and um, they said, you know, I got an idea. Everybody has, everybody out there is making a database and they're creating customers and con I mean, companies and or accounts, contacts, leads and opportunities. And, you know, they're making an application so that they can track that so that they can get up lists on sales and, you know, do what traditional customer relationship management is. Yeah. So they said, hey, why don't we just give them all that and make it easier on that? Well, obviously it was a great idea. Many companies now get on, you know, started to, you know, adopt these CRMs in it because it was easy to do. Well, now what you have is now you have in this inside the sales process, you have the ability to track your sales and and see what your pipeline is and how your lead conversion, how your marketing funnel is working. That was really the value of, of Salesforce when it started. But then it started to emerge into a much greater platform, right? It's a you know, it's not just sales, but it's now service that we're at. And now we got field service. And yeah. now they they have all these different clouds that they want to do. So they're really trying to become the hub for your customer. In fact, their marketing material says, I give you a 360 degree view of your customer. Yeah. Well, what happens now when and let's take our pool service guy as as an example. Let's say he now connects his his um his his pool pump yeah and data is now flowing into there and so if you have one pool pump connected and it flows into um, salesforce and all of a sudden on your account record or in your your workflows you get a notice that says oh you know sam is running out of chlorine for his pool so i want to open up an opportunity know that i need to send to order some chlorine or maybe open up a lead and then I want to, you know, send it to order fulfillment. And I want yeah. that process to happen automatically. I don't want it to be intervened. 
I need the data to come in from from the pool. Well, that's all fine and good. And yeah. the life cycle of a connected product goes like this. It says, all right, and we've seen this several times where they say, I want to connect. I want to connect my device. Okay. Yeah. Well, we go in and we say, look, you can connect your device. Then the next thing that comes in, people say, I want to see a graph of that. And so, oh, we see a graph of when, you know, what's going on. And, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And then they say, well, can you connect 100,000 of these? And then they have what I call the oh shit moment. Like, yeah. Oh shit. Now what are we going to do? Yeah. How are we going to manage all of this? How are we going to keep track of all this? So now you marry in, you have your customer relationship data inside Salesforce. You marry into that, you know, the different devices that they have. So if they've got a pool pump and maybe they've got a nest thermometer and maybe you're selling them all kinds of, you know, subscriptions or other types of businesses, how do you manage all that? And how do you get all that? So when you now go, when you say, okay, well, one one sensor is okay, but we want to, in order, we want a successful business. So to have a successful business, we need a hundred thousand, maybe a million sensors, and we just happen to be one company. Right. Now you add in connected vehicles, and you add in connected cities, and you add in all these different types of business models. The you know even agriculture, the connected farm, all that data comes in. How do you manage and how do you put intelligence? How do you put logic around data that's just kind of flowing? Yeah, We're very good. And we've, we've learned how to create businesses out of e-commerce. Ripple. So Amazon created a huge business out of all right, add to cart, <laughs> check out, give yeah. me your credit card, ship, you know, return that back and forth thing. But how do you manage that? And how do you put the intelligence in there when it's not, you know, you know, add to cart? It is. Oh. I'm out. It's an event. It's a message. It's a. It's something that happens. How do you manage that? And so that process and that ability to be able to manage that data as it comes in, yeah, add logic to it, and then give context against the CRM. That's really the value. Really interesting. So obviously, you know, I can see the value overall in terms of the opportunity that okay, if I am selling a product uh, to my customers, and if there are going to be any problems, then I want an alert as the brand, as the manufacturer, or as the distributor retailer so that I can call you, let's say, if you are going to be open for the conversation or for the part. That makes sense, right? Now, obviously, I want to peel some more layers there in terms of the architecture, because in my mind, when I look at any of the technology architecture, the technology is always going to be the easy part. What is hard always is going to be the political boundaries, okay? And I'll Mm -hmm. uh, describe the the politics here. Because here, what you are doing is, and I don't know how the architecture is implemented. I don't know whether you guys did any sort of MQTT uh, or whichever industry code or zero technology you might be utilizing. So maybe you can touch on that. But when I look at the politics, Here, the politics is going to be, okay, number one, you are touching my machine. You are touching my sensor, meaning I, as the manufacturer, have sold to my customer, and the customer has the ownership of the product. So if you want to put the sensor, you are putting in somebody else's product, okay? So now you are opening a security loophole there for somebody that you do not control from the legal perspective, from the political perspective, right? So I don't know what was the, uh, you know, political spectrum here in terms of the power control, you know, who owns what, whether they know who is going to be, uh, you know, owning the sensor in these devices and, you know, why are they allowing to send the data? So so maybe uh, you may want to touch a little bit on the number one, the technical architecture, and then, you know, political architecture as well, I guess. Yeah, no, that's, that's, you know, I, I always say, you know, the, the you know, technology is the easy part. It's managing the politics of technology. <laughs> that's the hard part. I completely agree with you. Um, so on the underlying technology, yeah, it is MQTT, the, you know, the message, tra- the protocol that we use underneath the covers, it's sending message. And MQTT is a, a published subscribe technology where you know, it basically sends out a message and think of a message as just a bunch of JSON, yeah. you know, a payload of, of data and it sends it out and it, if someone's listening and happens to pick it up, great. If someone's not listening and doesn't pick it up, then it just, that message just kind of falls on. And that's kind yeah. of a new concept, people. But that is, it is MQTT under the covers. Now, the political landscape is the thing that we have been navigating for the last 10 years. And yeah. I'll tell you, um, so number one, when we first started, security was obviously, you know, lots of stories that we heard about 
people hacking in devices and turning lights off in an entire hotel because they had a smart lock or being able to not start or being able to take a rental car because the device, you know, could connect to different cars and could turn the ignition on or open the doors or something. Lots of those stories happened in, you know, back in, you know, eight, eight, nine years ago when we first kind of started this. The security obviously has gotten, you know, we've gotten much, much better at it. We are, you know, every device is authenticated, is a certificate authentication. So it, think of that in terms of, you know, from a business perspective, it kind of goes back to when I, you know, one of my very first technology uh, adventures was the dot-com boom, right? When we yeah. started building a website. And I thought the websites was the greatest thing ever. And, you know, we're going to start selling products. And this is back in the early 90s. And everybody we went to said, there is no way anybody's ever going to put their credit card on the internet. There is no way people are going to purchase stuff on the internet. There's too much security loopholes. There's too many, you know, threats. There's going to be hacking. There's going to be pandemonium. Yeah. Well, there's not. I mean, did all of that stuff happen? Yes, it did. But it's not pandemonium. And we have are learning, you know, how to lock that down. And we have to, you know, there's a personal responsibility. There's a social a responsibility there. There's a technical responsibility there. There's a programmer's uh, uh, responsibility there, and so we're we're learning those. And as we've gone in the same the same kind of flow and the same kind of um, uh, evolutionary wave has happened in the IoT world. In the early days, it was the wild wild west, and you know no one knew what everything was unprotected. Today, yeah. every device is authenticated. But your other point is is uh, also well taken. What happens? Who owns that data? So, and this is something we're still working out. So what's happening is you have manufacturers who create a device. So I build the pool pump. I, yeah. I'm the guy who builds the pool pump. Well, it's my pool pump and I'm selling it to you, the, you know, the pool service guy. Yeah. And I want your data coming up into my cloud, right? So that, you, and then I will provide you services. Well, the pool guy is like, okay, well, I mean, I understand that, but I also have a connected pool pump. And I've got, you know, some, you know, a connected, you know, air compressor over here that does the the jets or something in the in the jacuzzi. That's done by a different manufacturer. And he wants that data going to his cloud. So now we got, you know, devices coming to respective clouds. And now we have to have a cloud of clouds yeah. that do all that. And so it is still a, a um, I would say, um, choose my word, just struggle, a challenge <laughs> to how to coordinate these different business models because so, the subscription economy is a very powerful thing. So if you're the pool pump guy and you're the air compressor guy, you want to maintain those subscriptions. You want to maintain that customer relationship. But it's really, you know, the pool service guy who needs to be managing that. And so having to integrate these these different clouds is something that at ThingLogix, we realized very early on that not only do we have to think of a device as a thing, in other words, the temperature sensor or the pool pump, is, we have to think of a company as a thing and that that company can give us um, data and messages. A quick example, we had a uh, uh, Cisco down in the Silicon Valley had a pilot program yep. called a thousand people out of prop poverty. And their goal was they wanted to create a system by which you could track care uh, uh, amongst people between, you know, the food bank and the job training center and the shelter and and help people manage their way out of poverty. And they wanted to do it through technology. And so we put in a bid. And our bid um, through the RFPs, we looked at it a little bit different. We said, let's not treat, you know, all these individual um, uh, agencies as just agencies that we have to integrate to. Let's yeah. treat them as things. Let's enable the business as a device. And so now a business can chirp an anonymous message about a, you know, without the PIH and all that. And they can chirp that to a central place where we encrypt it on both ways and encrypt it at rest. And we keep that, but we give the ability to be able to send messages and then coordinate care amongst these things. So it's not just devices that I think businesses can chirp things. And then once businesses, now you have a, a meta business that is, you know, managing messages of other business. Yeah. So some very interesting layers there. So I definitely want to dig a little deeper into the whole uh, technology aspect, because obviously you have a lot of depth in uh, technology. Uh, and when you look at the whole MQTT model, and I'm I'm shocked uh, that Amazon really found this technology to be so exciting, right? Uh, that they couldn't do it themselves, because obviously they are supposed to be more of the technology powerhouse, if you will, right? 
Um, yeah. So here, when you talk about the the whole pops up model, and by the way, this is the comment that I always get from the industry you know, community, and I'm like, okay, you know, pops up model, sure, it might be newer for industry 4.0 community, but let's say if you look at the the traditional IT and the programming world, the pops up model was always there overall in the mm. majority of the programming languages. For example, if you really think about it, okay, when you look at the web hooks. The whole concept of web hooks is really pops up because that's what it is mm-hmm. doing. You know, it is really publishing an event somewhere and then somebody is subscribing. In that case, you need to be slightly more confident in your architecture because that's a business message. You don't want to be missing your sales orders. In case of your the kind of you know scenarios that you are doing, in that the reliability is not as important just because you are trying to study and you know a couple of messages here and there. Who cares? Right? So this is just one pops up model. Now, if you look at, and I don't know if you are familiar with products such as Chipko Business Events, okay? They tried to launch business event back in, what, 2005, 2006, somewhere around mm. that. That was also a pop-up model. So pop up model is not necessarily new overall from the enterprise architecture perspective in the uh, enterprise software world. So what is so unique about MQTT as well as the pop up model that, Industry 4.0 community is finding it to be newer, that Amazon is finding it shocking that why is this so powerful that they are not able to figure out. So a couple of things there. So the the technology, see the, the pub sub model, you're right. So, yeah, you could put web hooks into a pub sub model because there's a there's a trigger. It's an event driven thing. Yeah. You'll see Salesforce, they now have a thing called platform events. Exactly. Uh, MuleSoft and all of these, all of the middleware vendors have event driven stuff but the exactly. event driven stuff is still more kind of endpoint driven it's still in and take let's take a, a webhook as an example okay a webhook is still a kind of a request response i'm going to something's going to happen and i'm just going to call a url i'm going to say hey i have a url so here's some data for you now you do with what it what you want and it goes over http yeah right so it's still it's still under the covers. There's still the request response architecture that sits down. Now the request is, hey, here's some data, and the response is, okay, thanks. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's essentially when you talk about webhooks. There's not, yeah, I got it, and thank you. MQTT is a little bit different in that because that event is um, has no, uh, and there's different levels. There's the what they call quality of service is zero, yeah. one, and two, and but. 90% of all MQTT traffic goes over and it basically says, hey, here's a message. Now, I don't know if you got it. I don't know if you received it. And I don't care. I yeah. am just I am just sending out and I'm talking and I'm chatting as fast as I can. And I am that's that data is out there. Now, how do you intercept that and how you put logic around that? really becomes a very different paradigm between then you know the technology because webhooks we still understand we still understand i understand you're going to send me something to a server and i'm going to write some code i'm going to upload it to that server i'm going to you know put an endpoint on there and i'm going to process but in a world where messages are flying around yeah uh, how do you put that in there that becomes a very different way of of looking at technology one thing that we had wanted to add is that in terms of messages flying around and how do you do that? One of the things we came out, we developed a, uh, spun up a company called Chirply. Yeah. And the idea around Chirply is nothing but, we took SMS messages, right? We said, okay, IoT messages, devices are sending messages back and forth, but you know what? Humans are sending messages back and forth. So maybe we should actually start putting some applications around SMS and not just around the old chat bot, right? So we all could do a chat bot. We can say, you know, keywords and we can fill slots and we can, we can carry on an artificial conversation with you. Yeah. But let's put in some real intelligence around those messages. Um, you know, let's, you know, not just um, let's put those messages into our sales cycle. So again, within in, within Salesforce, we incorporated text messaging and text allocation around messages coming in and out of Salesforce. So if you if you send a let's say you send me a text message and you say, Rob, I don't know what you're doing, but you know. Yeah, I don't like the stuff that you're doing and I don't like your product, right? And you just send that text message to me because of whatever. I can intercept that. I can analyze it for, you know, sentiment. I can see, oh, you're upset. 
uh, I can now automatically open up a case. I can actually assign a, a, an agent to that to call you back and increase. And that is an opportunity to make sure that that customer experience goes in the right way and not the wrong way. Similar for ordering products. One thing I did with our, our beef business, I threw away all the email addresses. and yeah. says, We're not doing any more email because a 1% response is not what we're, you know, is, is, is a good day. Yeah. And so we said, instead, we're just going to communicate with our customers via text message throughout there. And I send our customers and say, wait, would you like some more beef? Essentially, we know that you bought some beef last month. We think you might be out. Would you like some more? So the ordering experience now becomes, yes. Would you like the same as what you ordered? Yes. OK, it'll be there on Tuesday. Right. It's don't don't go to www.anything. Don't fill out a form. Don't add to basket. Let's con let's uh, conduct the transaction over in the in the means that we do. And it's not just adding a a, a chat bot that's inter interacting those messages with your order fulfillment system, or customer services, all those kinds of the ability to get an intercept message and put intelligence around the message is really the focus of what I think you know, whether it's MQTT and even SMS, which ultimately we actually convert everything to MQTT because um, that's how our logic, that's how our layer uh, interacts. Very interesting. So maybe you want to touch a little bit more on the, from the MQTT perspective uh, for the people who might not be familiar with what MQTT really is. So, you know, when you look at these protocols, formats, uh, some people might understand that maybe it's just a different way of structuring uh, the data. So do you want to talk about what an MQTT is, and let's say if I'm the CFO or the developer, and I am trying to consume MQTT in my architecture, so what do I need to know? What is MQTT, and how can it correlate with my architecture? Let's say if I, I may have my business architecture right now, and I am trying to sort of uh, take advantage of MQTT in my architecture, so where is it going to have the place? Yeah, um, so let's start, so let's Let's look at MQTT as it compares to what we all understand very well as HTTP, right? Yeah. So HTTP is basically a way for me to, for my computer to package up a bunch of data. So in that yeah. data could be, hey, I want to take product number 12 and put it in a basket so I can order it later. Right. Yeah. So you click the button. It sends product 12 to the server. The server goes, oh, it's Rob because he's logged in. He wants product number 12. That happens to be, you know, a new iPhone. So we're going to add it to his basket. It costs, you know, $12,000 or whatever iPhones cost these days. Yeah. Um, and then um, and now the next thing he does, it says, OK, I'm ready to check out. So HTTP packages up that data and sends it back. And we we continue on that paradigm with every click that we make yeah. in uh, on the web. So MQTT is um, is is a different protocol in the sense of it doesn't it doesn't wait for a a click. In fact, there is no click. So yeah. um, the best example I have is imagine a temperature sensor. I'm just all I am is a temperature sensor, and um, I you know like a thermometer that sits out on your front porch where it tells you what how, what temperature is outside, uh, and it has a little piece of firmware in there. And it says to that in, in that little microprocessor on that temperature sensor, it says, hey, I want you to go and tell this endpoint and an endpoint like in HTTP is like another URL. But in MQTT, it's in this sense, it's like tell my data center, which would be yep. Amazon, that my current temperature is 76 degrees. And then a second later, say, oh, it's 77. Oh, it's 76. So. MQTT doesn't wait for anybody to respond. It doesn't care if anybody's listening at all. It'll just yeah. keep sending and just chat, 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 chat. And that's why when you when you start thinking about that, wait a minute, these things never turn off. They never stop every second. They're going to send me, you know, what temperature is. I don't want it every second. I only care about every hour. Or maybe if a temperature gets above 100, do I care about? But when you think about, oh, my gosh, if that temperature sensor is sensing sending data every single second, how am I going to catch all that and how am I going to connect to it? And then when it does reach a hundred, where do I put the thing that says, if temperature is greater than a hundred, you know, turn on the air conditioning, where do I yeah. put that code? Cause there's no server anywhere. There's no place for me to upload my code to and yeah. those kinds of yeah. things. So that MQTT is that in think it's like a stream of consciousness and everybody's talking all at the same time. And so what thing logics did is took that screen stream of consciousness all that message is it says, hey, 
And we've, we've created a place and says, okay, Mr. Developer, Mr. Business, you how here's a thermometer that says it's over 100. Or we have an, another company called Thermix AI, which we put the sensors in freezers. Yeah. When we say, oh, is the temperature above zero? Yeah. Then send me a message, open a service ticket, because if I've got, you know, in our particular case, we have walk-in freezers that have tens of thousands of inventory in there. And if that temperature gets above, you know, too high, I'm going to lose a lot of money and there's going to be a lot of uh, problems only in the quality of the meat and all that other stuff. So if, you know, it says, I'm zero, I'm zero, I'm zero, I'm zero. And it just sits there and listens. And then at some point it goes, wait a minute, I'm five degrees. Oh, if you're five degrees, you've gone up to five. It's soon enough for me to go catch it. I can make, I can take an action if I know it's that. So then you, with, with the logic and the intelligence you put in that message system, you can now start doing your stuff, open trouble tickets, send a text message. If you even want to send an email, you could. I don't know why anybody would ever send an email these days, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know, take an action. Yeah, so some very interesting layers there. So I am actually going to be sharing, uh, you know, some more layers from my perspective, and then, you know, you can dis- disagree with my understanding, uh, you know, of it, if you like. So when you say HTTP, obviously, HTTP is the basic, you know, protocol that everybody sort of understands. But in my experience, if I'm putting sort of the developer hat on, uh, in my mind, I don't think HTTP is the right comparison uh, for something like MQGT because HTTP originally was really designed for the synchronous communication, and that mm-hmm. that is probably the right word. Here, what mm-hmm. you are talking about is the asynchronous communication. Mm-hmm. Okay, asynchronous mm-hmm. communication is going to be very different by default. The way it works, the way it uh, you know all of the players in the asynchronous communication is going to be sort of communicating with each other. Now, the right comparison in my mind that nobody talks about is probably going to be some sort of, you know, GMS or Java messaging services that was part of the ESP layer. Uh, I don't know whether you have ever, you know, played Mm. with that. But GMS was always sort of there in that they always had the sub architecture. There was broker communication. The challenge with the GMS communication or the ESP layer is going to be because that was designed more for the guaranteed delivery. And when you are going to have mm. guaranteed delivery at the network level, at the application level, then what is going to happen is it's going to cause a lot of delay. And then the volume that you were talking about, the 10 million messages, that in my understanding is that why Amazon would not be able to do that because they didn't have any sort of protocol that was lightweight enough to be able to uh, you know exchange these messages at that high volume. Because you know when you are going to add that persistent sort of layer, the guaranteed layer, then your communication is going to be far slower and you are probably going to be requiring a lot more resources than you probably need for the kind of data that you are talking about. The other thing that I am going to bring in more from the network perspective, so there are there were always two layers from the network mindset as well. One was TCP, the second was UDP. I'm pretty sure you are probably familiar with that. Mm-hmm. TCP was mm-hmm. always known for more of the guaranteed delivery. UDP was not for the guaranteed delivery. And typically, if you're going to have any sort of communication that was not guaranteed, you would probably uh, use UDP. So now, mm-hmm. layering all of that, is MQTT trying to utilize some sort of UDP model underneath? Uh, what is going on here? Do you want to paint some more colors? Do you have any follow-up commentary there by any chance? Yeah. So uh, when we first started uh, building the ingestion, uh, so they inside MQTT, there is this notion, what they call quality of service, QoS. It's zero, one, or two. Zero says, I I may I have a message and I I'm going to try and send it out and if, if somebody's listening great yeah one says and and I don't even know if the message got out successfully quality service one says okay well I I am going to send the message and I, I I I sent it someplace and I didn't get an error so I'm okay QoS two is what you talked about guaranteed delivery it's yep. a handshake it's a handshake it's I have a message. I'm sending it to you. Uh, did you get the message? I got the message. This is how big it was. Yep, that's what I sent. We're done. That little conversation that goes back to the guaranteed yeah. delivery is, as you said, very expensive in terms of technology. When Amazon purchased um, t- telemetry and they implemented it, they did not, and to this day, to my knowledge, have not implemented QoS2. They do not implement the guaranteed delivery on the MQTT broker. It is available in the spec. Um, you can Implement, but we left, and their their choice on that was saying, okay, we're going to leave that to the developer. This service is we're going to send data back and forth. Now, if you want to implement the guaranteed delivery, you can do that. Hey, I got the message. Did you send this one? How much did you send? 
and then sequencing. Now you get into queuing messages and message queues and then how that sequencing and they have services, you know, Kinesis and all those other services around Amazon that guarantee, you know, order of messages and that kind of stuff. So you have to actually combine the services of Amazon in order to get that guaranteed delivery. Now, I guess the philosophical question is, um, do you need it? You know, in a strict, if, if a temperature sensor says every second, it says I'm 76, I'm 76, I'm 76, and you miss it one time or two times or 90 times out of 100, all you care about is, okay, well, I, I got it. I'm yeah. getting it. And did I get every single message? I don't really care. If the message is, you know, hey, I want to, you know, I need to purchase some medical oxygen and I need the oxygen um, at this address and because my oxygen tanks are going to run out. Well, you might want to make sure you don't yep. miss those messages. So the decision was made, hey, we're going to put the onus on the application to say, if you want to implement guaranteed delivery, yes, you can do it. So it's still there, but you're right. It's an extra effort. It's an expensive thing. And I think the the philosophical the decision they made, especially early on, was there wasn't enough people at that time who even knew what MQTT was, um, <laughs> let alone cared about guaranteed delivery on top of that protocol. Yeah, so some very interesting layers there. And, you know, again, when I listen to my developer community, they are all very, you know, passionate and, and fascinated by the new technologies. You talk to my, uh, you know, black blockchain guys, they are always going to be talking about, you know, how blockchain... Um, you talk to yeah. your, uh, you know, Web 3.0 guy. They are going to be talking about how Web 3.0 is going to take over the world. And <laughs> uh, MQTT guys, they are going yeah. to be talking yeah. about how MQTT is going to be uh, taking yeah. over the world. But in my mind, if I look at more from the CIO or enterprise architect perspective, you know, in my mind, everything has a place. Everything is going to have pros and cons. They are designed for the specific architecture. So MQTT, in my mind, the reason why it makes sense in the enterprise architecture is because it's designed for the operational data that does not require as much guaranteed delivery so that more things can move faster as opposed yeah. to utilizing that for something else where you require guaranteed delivery. I mean, if you are not going to be closing your DLs, you know, good luck with that. Yeah. So, you know, my, my industry 4.0 community always argues that, you know what? MQTT, MQTT, you know, they are going to replace the ELP. Sorry, <laughs> that's not how ELPs yeah. are supposed to work. That's not how yeah. the other technology. So everything is going to have sort of pros and cons. Do you agree with me? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think there's a silver bullet on any of these technologies. And I think that actually the real value and one of the things that, you know, I said, you know, probably 15, 20 years ago after, because I'm a tradition, I started as a traditional Java programmer. So yeah. I was coding and, you know, I, and it was always fun, you know, like oh, I got a new idea. I got to do it. We're always looking like, oh, we can. But there came a point in enterprise computing that our job became more of um, uh, as, as integrators rather than innovators and exactly um, we were supposed to be innovating in other words there's nothing new under the sun there's yes. lots of really cool stuff out there and the open source community really took this to the to the nth degree back in the day when we first started open sourcing everything and well okay i got i got my database server i got my application server i got my programming language and none of it cost me anything and i got all these great communities out here so let's take this little piece and let's take that little piece and let them do what they are good at doing and I think the danger is that, and I see this happen a lot in the Salesforce, yeah, because uh, I've been I've been doing Salesforce consulting for a number of years, and a lot of times people will look at an application, yeah. look at a, a company like Salesforce, and go, "Oh, I want to do everything on Salesforce." <laughs> well, Salesforce does really good at certain things, like it's exactly. a really great CRM. I it's not a very good you know data cruncher, and it's not a, an IoT broker, and it's not all things to all of all people, and I think. You know, to your point, yeah, I don't think MQT is the silver bullet on this, but I think it's a piece of it. And I don't think I don't I don't think we're going to get rid of HTTP and all of a sudden we're, webhooks are going to go away. But it, there's a piece of it there. You know, there's still and I heard a statistic. There's some ad, astronomical percentage of COBOL code that yeah. is running, you know, running uh, Enterprise America these days. Yeah. And so things don't go away. And I, I think if we always start to think. Oh, we got to go this way, or we're gonna have this. Is it? That's where we get into like it's it's taking what these things do well and putting them together. And I think it's the same thing, you know, when you start talking about management practices and you know when talking about human resources and managing yep. people, you don't take all these people and make them do what you want them to do. You take these people 
you find out what they do really well. And your job is to find out what they do well and manage that and make it into a solution and a system. It's the same thing with technology. Use the things that do really well. And our job as technologists is to manage and put that into a way so that it, it the solution is elegant and even, you know, artistic, if you will. <laughs> um, uh, we always have the, the debate, is it science or is it art? And I think exactly. uh, technology is more art than it is science. Exactly. So I'm going to have one more last question overall from the cybersecurity perspective, since you mentioned that you started as the Java developer, right? So traditional days, you know, IT used to be very conservative overall in terms of the way IT used to work. Uh, and that's why we had such long cycle of, um, you know, of the programming. I mean, you, you had to compile the code, then you had some sort of exact, uh, executable that you are going to deploy in the server that is going to do some magic. But now, if you look at the newer programming languages, they are going to be slightly friendlier for the developers. I don't know how good they are going to be uh, from the cybersecurity. But when I look at the overall maturity of Industry 4.0 community, you know, it's still not there overall in their understanding of how the cybersecurity practices work in my mind. And I don't know whether you followed the news of Jacuzzi. Jacuzzi, you know, had the cyber breach. It was a, if you actually pay attention to the details there, it was really basic, um, you know, what the hacker did. It's not that, you know, hacker had to do extraordinary thing to be able to break into that. The only reason why they could, uh, you know, break into that is because it was just easier to reverse engineer. It's like, you know, yeah. I have my open source code. I'm looking at my open source code and I'm trying to figure out, okay, how do I reverse engineer this, right? Now, if you are going to do this in the case of, let's say, the classic programming languages, for example, Java, you know, they had very traditional way of doing programming, you know, but the newer programming languages are not as, uh, you know, sophisticated uh, overall in their maturity. So do you see that as a cybersecurity risk or are you comfortable right now with the newer ones as well? No, no, <laughs> no. I, <laughs> uh, and in fact, it, and you know, it, it it starts to the easier we make it to create applications and the the some of these higher level languages, you know, that we're starting to see come out that are exactly you know built on top of other languages. The whole point of those is to make coders more efficient, to make them faster. Yeah. Uh, but it also makes for lazy practices. It makes for you know have to be disciplined in your writing of your code. Um, now I, you know, I am, you know, an app obviously because I'm in the IoT world, I'm an advocate for the whole serverless, you know, notion of of deploying. And so whether you're doing AWS or whether you're doing Azure, uh, I just I don't know if you saw it, but Google just announced they're getting out of the IoT business. They they're decommissioned their IoT brokers, not that platform anymore. But these micro functions, the the lambda functions that sit yeah. on on top of AWS or in um, in Azure, I think they call them Microsoft Functions. That'd be where it's this very small set of code. So you're not writing code to do everything like we used yeah. to. You're not writing an end-to-end -end application. Um, uh, the idea is you're you're writing, you know, one little micro piece that's being deployed to a you know a container. It's being containerized. So there's no longer the well, there is there there no longer needs to be <laughs> this behemoth application that is being used and you can go and start you know reverse engineering thing it is so distributed even within the vendor even within amazon a 100% serverless application like we have at, at thinglogic is so distributed amongst different services and then and then protected you know in front of it with the, the traditional firewalls and stuff like that that is so much harder to to do that so uh, deploying these large applications using these higher level languages for the speed. Um, I, it is, you know, and I think you know, one of the, my son became a, a programmer and one of the, 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 one of the classes that I was very grateful that I saw him taking was, you know, the discipline and the ethics of yeah. a coder, right? You know, you have to have some discipline and you have to have some ethics and some morals that go around when you're doing your practice, because without that, you are the, the you're the weakest link. You are yep. going to expose it. And without some of that assurance and, you know, they always said in when you're when you're uh, airlines, you know, the ideal is to have a very old pilot and yeah. a very young pilot flying together. 
you know, the old guy is going to be more conservative. He's going to know what he does. But sometimes you want the young guy that's going to take a little risk because you may have to do something heroic, you know. And I think pairing that and keeping those mentors, even in our industry, um, is 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 paramount because that that discipline and that moral of of how you're going to code is going to be the first line of defense in any of these. We only can put so many firewalls up and we can only put, you know, so many white lists and other things up there. All right. Amazing insight. So that's it for today. Do you have any last minute uh, closing advice or remarks for our listeners? Uh, I would say don't be afraid of the IoT world. Um, I think it, it, we I think we are at the point and we we're like at 1990, you know, 97 with um with, with IoT as it compared to e-commerce, like wherever. Well, I don't know if we're going to do it. I don't know if people are going to. Is the Internet going to last? Well, you know, the IoT world is is going to stay. It, there's great opportunities in terms of how to structure businesses around that. And I said, don't be afraid of it. And uh, it's going to be the differentiator in my mind between enterprises. Thank Could you, Sam. Agree. I appreciate you having us on. Of course. Could not agree more. And I share the same mindset and the feeling as well that there are definitely going to be opportunities in the IoT world, especially when you look at from the lenses of opportunities. On that note, Rob, I really want to thank you. This has been a powerful episode. Thank you so much, Sam. I appreciate having us. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you'd like to learn more about Rob and the rest of the ThingLogics team, head over to ThingLogics.com. It's T-H-I-N-G-L-O-G-I-X.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Pratik Joshi, who shares his insights into the operational data platform and their role in the enterprise architecture for manufacturing companies. Also, the interview with Adam Gluck, who shares his insights into the importance of structured software development and release processes and the role of DevOps for manufacturing OT environments. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to get you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.